I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I, today I'm speaking with Michael Bonfiglio, the director and executive producer of George Carlin's American Dream uh, as part of our Meet the Experts documentary panel. Uh, first thing I wanted to ask was, uh, what was your first memory of hearing a George Carlin comedy routine? I think it was probably when I was in high school. Um, I don't have a specific memory of what show it was, but I do remember in high school discovering him through the HBO specials and just really um, connecting with, uh, you know, a guy who, you know, the HBO specials in the 90s, um, you know, a grown up that was saying all of these very subversive anti-establishment kinds of things, making a lot of sense of the world. Um, and being funny doing it, uh, really, I, I connected with it. You know, there's so many, um, uh, it, it, it's such a fascinating look at uh, the intimate parts of Carlin's life and his career. What aspect of his life and career did you find the most fascinating to learn about? Well, there were so many interesting facets of his life and career, and, you know, so little was known about his personal life. Um, you know, his, his career spanned so many years. I mean, he started around 1960 and just died 14 years ago. So, um, you know, in 98. So, you know, it was a long career, 50 years. And so, um, you know, the idea of, of getting to explore a, the, the, the personal life of an artist as he was able to weather all kinds of transitions in his own work, in his own life, um, and in the culture that, that he was very much a part of uh, was really fascinating. But I, I personally um, loved looking into his early days when um, he's kind of finding his voice before the, uh, the, the transition to the counterculture guy. Um, but the early days of when he's wearing a suit and tie and he's trying to kind of emulate Lenny Bruce, but he's also trying to get really mainstream successful um, and he's just a struggling artist, you know, um, and that that was really fascinating to me. Um, I, I love the use of, um, of the notes that we see, the handwritten notes that we see throughout. Were those uh, uh, real handwritten notes that we see throughout the whole throughout the whole uh, uh, special? They were. Um, we had a, a brilliant uh, animator named uh, Stefan Nadelman who treated all of those, but they were all real notes. Um, Carlin was a was a hoarder, and he kept everything throughout his life from his childhood. Even you know the little childhood drawings and things that we have in the film; those are all real. Um, he just hung on to things forever, and um, so as a documentary filmmaker, um, you know, making something that uh, is so heavily, heavily based in archival. Um, it was an incredible treasure to, to have all that stuff. What was it like to go through all of those, per all of that personal writing? Uh, I'm just, I'm just curious, what was it like to go through all of that? Yeah, I mean, it was fascinating. I mean, uh, there was one trove of personal letters that, um, that Kelly Carlin found right at the very end. Most of, of Carlin's materials um, are stored at the National Comedy Center and it had kind of been cataloged and archived. So, so it was a lot of stuff was already really well organized for us going into it, which was also a really exciting thing. Um, but right toward the end, um, we had asked Kelly about fact checking something and she found a, an envelope full of letters that her back and forth from her parents um, that they'd written early on in their courtship in, in the early 60s. Um, and so that was really cool because it was very, you know, on the one hand, you feel a little bit like a voyeur um, because these people are sharing these, you know, very intimate thoughts on their, their, their love. Um, and then at the same time, it, it humanized and illuminated uh, other sides of, of Carlin um, that were, uh, it, it was really cool to discover that stuff. Uh, so how did you and, uh, and Judd Apatow end up directing this project together? Well, it actually came to Judd first, and he called me. Um, he was Judd was approached by HBO, um, and uh, you know he was interested. And he and I have made a bunch of films together, and he wanted us to do it together. So he called me, and I was, of course, you know, who's going to say no? I, it was very, very exciting. Um, so that's yeah, that's how it happened. Judd brought me into it. So and, and uh, you just before you mentioned. Um, uh, Carlin's daughter Kelly, who was a very big part of uh, of helping to make this happen, what was she like to have as a collab as a collaborator on this uh, and helping to get all of this material uh, uh, to you guys? 
Well, we couldn't have made the film without Kelly. Um, she uh, and uh, Jerry Hamza control all of George's material, all of his, his HBO specials, all of that stuff is owned and controlled by them. So it would have been really impossible um, to make the film that we made um, without uh, Kelly's cooperation and help. But it was also great to have access to Kelly um, through her interview um, and to get her perspective on so much of it. You know, George did so many interviews and, and he left behind a really strong records of what he felt at different times and, and his take on, on his life and career. Um, but to have another perspective who was there, who's still alive, and who was there through a lot of the tough things, um, it was, uh, it, it, it was a, a, an incredible benefit to the film. And she's a lovely person, so it was great working with her. Uh, you know, it's it, as someone who uh, became familiar with Carlin uh, in in his later years. Um, you know, there's definitely it, it, there's definitely a single perspective, especially his last couple his last couple of specials became much more. I don't know if pessimistic is the right word, but do you think not the wrong uh, word? Do you think that uh, uh, to call him, especially that let those those last couple of specials to call him a nihilist uh, would be accurate? Um, I understand that you're not you're not him, but in I, your opinion, yeah, I, I I don't, yeah, I I don't personally believe that he was truly a nihilist. I believe that he expressed nihilistic views. Um, you know, when you name your comedy special "Life Is Worth Losing," um, it's pretty you know it's pretty dark. Um, but I believe that he was using that nihilism and that point of view to illuminate other truths and to try and wake people up and, and look at, at our behavior, how we treat one another, how we treat the planet, um, you know, how we organize ourselves as a society. Um, I, I think that, that his negative stances and his, the nihilism that he showed on stage was, um, it was a comedic stance um, that was very effective in, in getting, getting a lot of ideas across. Um, uh, one other thing I was curious about is uh, uh, you've done, uh, you've directed several comedy specials and you've also directed uh, several, a couple documentaries about stand-up comedians. Um, is there a comedian whose life and career are, do, that, are, that you think are worthy of a doc treatment uh, like this? As, but as far as you know, they haven't gotten one yet? Oh, I think there are a whole bunch. I, I think that there, you know, there's so many fascinating artists um, in comedy. Uh, who have done so many unique things. Um, I think it's really cool that we're sort of in a period now where people, you know, that, that broader audiences seem to be interested in these stories. You know, um, when I was in high school just discovering George Carlin, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff about comedy out there. Um, and now there's, there's a, almost a glut of it. And, um, but as a comedy fan and somebody who's interested in, stories about artists and how they make their way through the world. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a great thing. Um, but to name a specific person, I, I, I don't know if I'm qualified or comfortable. Just do you have a personal, uh, who is, I was curious as to, uh, of the comedians that you spoke to and, and their reflection of Carlin, uh, who was the one that uh, you just most enjoyed hearing either stories about him or uh, what, it, what he meant to them? I guess my personal one, because he was the first stand-up comic I ever saw perform live was Stephen Wright. Um, I'm a huge fan of his and, uh, you know, seeing him at 14 years old or 15 years old um, was, you know, a remarkable life experience for me. And uh, so getting to meet him and he was a very sweet guy. I was also fascinated by the fact that he was such a massive Carlin fan, um, which I would not have guessed, um, you know, prior to doing this. So that was that was sort of a personal personal highlight for me. Well, uh, Michael, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best, and we look forward thank to you. seeing you uh, at our panel in just a little bit. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Charlie.